Good morning and welcome to the Salvation Army in Bedlington and our online worship. Today, we're starting a series of meetings that lead us into Easter and our theme today is the Lord's Prayer. And how do we pray? As many different ways as there are people. Some of us pray with our eyes closed, others with our eyes open. Some raise their hands, others lower their heads. Some pray regularly, others sporadically. Some pray easily, for others it takes great effort. Daniel prayed three times a day at a set time and place. David seems to be more spontaneous. Moses made lengthy intercessions for the Israelites. Job called out to God in his anger and despair. Mary called out to him in joy and exultation. However, they came with their prayers, they came in their own way, with their own words, standing or kneeling, they came. And maybe there's something to be learned from that. Maybe it's not so important how we come, but that we come. Psalm 86 says, hear me, Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord. For I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good abounding in love to all who call to you. I love those words from that psalm. And I love the words to joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Let's sing that song together. Sing it out wherever you are.
Our territorial headquarters has produced a series of five videos that emphasize our work in various parts of the world. And it's all a part of our self-denial effort that takes place at this time of the year, every year. And I said five, we're going to do this in this meeting and the next two. And we're going to have two of those videos today in this meeting, two next Sunday and one the Sunday after that, as well in that service, as well as a time when you can give uh, to self-denial. There'll be an emphasis in that meeting for that. And so I wanna encourage you to give your attention to the first video and the second video, but it's going to be split up by some music from YP Band and from a testimony from Ross Floyd, who has had some experience overseas uh, in doing some work, and uh, he's got a lot to say about that. So please give your attention to this video, and we'll see you at the end of the second video. Hello and welcome to the first of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. My name is Ben Cottrell, and as we live through the various lockdown measures in place across our territory, I'm going to be looking beyond our borders. For this year's self-denial appeal, I'm going to focus on some of the places we've featured in previous appeals and catch up with people we've met along the way to find out how they've been coping during the pandemic. But first, let's look at last year's appeal. Last year, we travelled to the city of Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. We met Andre and Nana Togo and saw some of the amazing things that they're doing there. We saw a thriving corps full of enthusiastic new soldiers and we saw how the Salvation Army is supporting people in the local community. You gave generously once again. Thank you so much. Your self-denial money is already being put to good use. And as a little reminder about how self-denial works, here's Ashley Bowles, who presented our films a couple of years ago. The money you gave through self-denial is used to support the mission of the Salvation Army around the world, including our mission partners. The idea of self-denial was first introduced in London by William Booth in 1886. He said, go without something and give what you would have spent to the Salvation Army's work. That was over 130 years ago. Now, nearly every Salvation Army Corps the world over plays its part. So if you are giving in London, Clanethley, Larn or Lockerbie, you are joining with Salvationists in Oslo, Ohio or Ouagadougou, which is the capital city of Burkina Faso. The money is redistributed by international headquarters to the places that need it most. It funds the background things, the not so exciting but essential things, so that Salvation Army staff and volunteers can get on and do what they're good at, like the work in Burkina Faso. Well, as Ashley has reminded us, some of the self-denial money you raised goes to our mission partners, but quite a lot goes to other mission support work all over the globe. Mission support was crucial in enabling the work in Burkina Faso, as the seedling Salvation Army took root and began to flourish. For over a year, I've had the privilege of working for the International Development Team at Territorial Headquarters. It's given me a further insight into the international work of the Salvation Army, and I've been involved in some of the projects which have been funded by self-denial. I live here at William Booth College with my wife, Rebecca, and our two children. And in a few weeks' time, we'll be moving to a court in East London. But this time last year, we were waiting for visas to go and work in Pakistan. Like so many other people around the world, our plans were disrupted by the global pandemic. Of course, lots of people have faced real hardship, and while it's been frustrating for us, we are well and healthy, so we are grateful for that. As we adjust to this change for us, and as we think about self-denial, I want to find out about how the Salvation Army around the world has adapted. So for the next five weeks, we'll be revisiting some of the places we've been to before. I'll be asking people how they're coping and what life is like where they are. 
I'll be talking to Fozia Columbus in Pakistan. She featured in 2016 when Kerry Coke visited the Salvation Army's territorial headquarters in Lahore. I'll be talking to Melinda Boone from the Philippines. Melinda features in the Salvation Army's Helping Hand Appeal films from last year. She works in anti-human trafficking. I'll be talking to Richard Bradbury. Richard and his wife Heidi have been serving in Bangladesh for the last two and a half years. They're there with their two children and work at headquarters in Dhaka, the country's capital. But next week, we'll pick up where we left off last year. I'll be talking to Nana Togo, who we saw in Burkina Faso. I'll look forward to seeing you then. So Major Cheryl asked me to share a few thoughts about uh, my experience at the uh, Chicken Cutter Mission Hospital in Zambia. Uh, and Rachel, my wife and I went just after we got married in 2016, um, which is particularly relevant to think about at the moment in the season of self-denial, where we're thinking about projects abroad that the Salvation Army supports. Um, so. Chicken Cutter Mission was started in 1946 after a local tribesman called Charlie Chicken Cutter. Uh, he had heard about the army's good work in Zimbabwe and he invited them to come and uh, to do some education and offered them a portion of, of land to set up the mission. So from that small investment of time and money in 1946 grew a, a town basically where in Chicken Cutter they have a, a medical school, a nursing school, high school, a hospital, even have a radio station. And this serves a population of 100,000 people across rural Zambia. So it's really quite remote. It's about 20 miles off the main road over like dirty, bumpy tracks just to get there. And by our standards, we would think it was very under-resourced, but there it's, it's you know, state of the art. And so 
you can see the benefits of uh, the investment that the Army's made um, and about the continued importance of giving to mission partners abroad. And we were helping out in the hospital uh, and doing what we could, which felt limited at times. Um, but the thing that struck me and was an important lesson to both of us was the, the, the positivity that the people had. Now, sometimes they would walk like nine miles in the boiling hot to get to the hospital to come for an x-ray or a test. And unfortunately, if uh, the wind turbine was off and the electricity had gone, they couldn't have their x-ray. And they didn't complain. And, you know, in this country, if someone, you know, there's a pothole in the road or someone graffitis the sign, you know, we're right at the MP or right, I'm going to go on bygone bedlam and I'm going to complain about that. But there, they're just, all right, fair enough, come back tomorrow. So I think generally they were quite relaxed people, but the, the positivity um, amazed us really in such adversity and difficult conditions, how they could just rejoice. And that was particularly seen uh, at the meetings that we went to with the Chicken Carter Citadel Corps, um, where it's probably the only place I've ever been where I was one of the earliest people there, which was uh, fantastic for me, um, known for being late. But they would just turn up in the hundreds and they would just sort of stroll in, um, clapping their hands, uh, rejoicing, just so glad to be there and to be in the house of the Lord. That was really refreshing to see. And every week someone would, would start with a prayer and uh, what would often be said is, Dear God, thank you that today I am in the land of the living. And that struck me because these are these were working age people. They weren't elderly people or people with any health problems. But the reality of living in rural Africa was that there were that many things that could make you suddenly unwell and you, you might not have treatments available that even you know just to be able to come to worship and to be alive on that morning was was something that they mentioned specifically and that's something that we'll probably possibly take for granted you know that we actually wake up every day in a nice warm bed and, and we've got health and, and food and things like that and the blessings that they they enjoyed um it was quite humbling really um but the lord spoke to us both there and you know reminded us of the importance of enjoying and uh, celebrating being able to worship with such freedom um, I think about that, the place a lot um, and the lessons that it, it taught us um, but overall I just hope that uh, I can continue to, to serve uh, in God's church wherever that is um, in our own small corner and that the ongoing mission around the world of the Salvation Army will continue to flourish. Hello and welcome to the second of our films for this year's Self-Denial Appeal. This year, we're revisiting some of the people and places we've featured before. In a moment, I'm going to be talking to Nana Togo, Nana presented last year's films from Burkina Faso. She and her husband Andre started the Salvation Army's work there in 2016. They began as just eight Salvationists, but when we visited there were 182 senior soldiers and 36 junior soldiers from two corps and two outposts. While we were there we saw 20 senior soldiers and nine junior soldiers being enrolled. We saw how the Salvation Army has been helping people who were struggling. Women from the local community have learned to read and write, and to sew and to dye cloth. Micro-enterprise projects mean these women now are earning enough money to send their children to school. And outreach projects mean some of the local men have started to come along on a Sunday. So I'm going to get in touch with Nana and find out how she and Andre are getting on. Hi, Captain Nana Togo. Nice to meet you. Ça va? Oui, ça va. <laughs> really good to speak to you. Um, I know your husband, Captain Andre Togo, really well. Um, I've been working yeah. with him for over a year, but I've never met you, so this is a real pleasure. How are you? How has life been? How was 2020? We are doing well. I'm doing well with my husband and uh, our two kids. 
life in uh, 2020 has not been easy. It has been very challenging. But still, we thank God for his grace, which has been sufficient through this uh, difficult time. Can I call you Nana or Captain Nana? Please go ahead. Nana, I understand you and, and, and Andre, you have a new appointment. Have you moved from Burkina Faso now? Yeah, we are in Mali. We are the currently regional secretaries. I'm the regional secretary for women ministry and Andre the regional secretary. But both we have got an additional appointment, co-officers of uh, ASEID Miller. How has the pandemic uh, affected the Ministry of the Salvation Army in the region? Because we, when we read the statistics for Burkina Faso and Mali, the, the, the death count is relatively low, but the economic impact seem to be seems from what you're saying is quite large is that correct it is correct you know the situation usually it is not easy in africa particularly in Burkina faso where we have been seeing extreme poverty mm. and when the, this pandemic of covid 19 came the situation became western as well in mali you know people don't have access to uh, this is elementary needs and it is very difficult. Churches as well have been affected, even schools in all areas. Everybody is affected by this pandemic. The community project we have been uh, working with uh, in Burkina Faso, there were so many with ladies. Most of them, sorry, have been stopped also because of this pandemic pandemic issue like the juice production, soap making. But uh, we also thank God through the Salvation Army always, we managed to still meet some need of the people and we thank God for that. One of the things we've been able to partner with the Mali region on this year is to fund um, uh, with you a project vehicle. Can you tell us the impact the project vehicle has had? We have got so many remote areas in Mali that it wasn't easy at all. Mm. But now we are really relieved from that burden of not being able to, to, to visit our communities. At any time, the vehicle is moving, even from Mali to Burkina Faso, doing the community work. We are really grateful for that. And, and, and what about uh, you, Nana? What have you been learning from 2020 in your own life? People always thought that, you know, to show love to each other, we just have to be together, sit together, fellowship together. And through this coronavirus, I have learned that it is not necessary, it is not an obligation to be physically present, you know, to demonstrate your love. Even though we can be a... a absent physically but in mind through practical action still we keep that bound you know of humanity we share together thanks for your inspiration to us in the united kingdom and republic of ireland and um, god bless you okay thank you very much to you too benjamin and uh, be assured of how our prayer support we are praying for you day and night you are in our mind and uh, thought in our heart May the Lord keep on visiting you individually and as a territory as well. Thanks so much. Bye, Nana. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> in next week's film, I'll be talking to Richard Bradbury, who's serving in Bangladesh. Good morning. As we go to prayer this morning, I would ask that first of all, we just take a moment and individually think of something this past week that God has blessed us with. Just take a moment and thank him in your heart. I'm thankful this week because God gave wisdom to all the scientists to develop a vaccine. And now over 20 million people have had that jab, including myself this week. Praise the Lord. 
It's good, isn't it? That God gives man wisdom. As we go to prayer this week, there are several things that we need to pray for. The family of Gladys Richardson, who passed away. The continued work of our government during the pandemic. The work of our Salvation Army leaders, both nationally, regionally and locally. That we would have wisdom on how best to restart services and restart activities safely. At the end of our prayer time this morning, I would ask that you join me as we pray the Lord's Prayer together, which will be studied later on during this service. So let's pray. Father, this morning, thank you for every blessing that you give to us. Lord, we must be a thankful people because you are a good, good father. Lord, our heart goes out to the family of Gladys. We ask that you would surround them with your peace and your comfort at this time. We think maybe of all those within our core that are not well, that you would draw alongside them just now with your healing touch and let them know we're praying for them. We think of our nation and Lord, we're still in the midst of a pandemic and Lord, we need you to give wisdom to our leaders. To all the government leaders, the science leaders, the leaders of the NHS, Father, endear them with wisdom on how best to bring our country back to some form of normality. In the same way, we pray for our Salvation Army, that Lord, indeed, you would give wisdom to our territorial, divisional and local leaders and how we can safely reopen our church services and our activities. Father, thank you for the wisdom that you give to your people. You are indeed a good father, a good God, who blesses his children beyond measure. For that we are indeed thankful. Lord, we conclude this time by praying together the prayer that you taught us with the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, I want to say thank you, Major Mark Dooley, for leading us in that time of prayer. And in the Salvation Army songbook, we find this chorus. It says, prayer gently lifts me to highest heaven, from earth's confusion to Jesus' breast. My sin and weakness, my doubt and sorrow are lost forever in sweetest rest. And so... Why don't we lose ourselves right now in sweetest rest as we listen to this song from Earth's Confusion?
The reading this morning is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 to 13. One day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. Then the one inside answers, Don't bother me, the door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him the bread, because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Amen.
The disciples were just children, really. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately the disciples dropped their nets and followed him. Who, other than children, would so recklessly abandon the responsibilities of adult life for such a daring promise of adventure? Following Jesus was like falling into a fairy tale. Water turned into wine. Thousands fed from a boy's lunchbox. A stormy sea suddenly calmed. A blind man healed. A demon-possessed man delivered. A dead child brought back to life. The disciples were as wide-eyed as children in Wonderland, always popping up their hands with questions, ever eager to learn. Lord, teach us to pray. The disciples had seen Jesus pray on many occasions. Sometimes they would wake stiffly in the middle of the night to find him absent from the weary band of men huddled in feeble warmth around the gray embers of the campfire. He would be off somewhere by himself praying. And occasionally in the quiet of the night, they could overhear him. His prayers were not a filigree of golden words, as were the prayers of the religious leaders they were so accustomed to hearing. Neither were they the ecstatic babblings heard coming from the pagan temples. They had the familiar warmth of a son speaking to his father. The disciples yearned for that type of intimacy with God, but they didn't know how to attain it. Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught the disciples. So Jesus sits down and teaches them. The lesson is less what you'd expect to find on a seminary student's shelf, and more what you'd expect to find framed above a child's bed. An embroidered sample, maybe. With a stitchwork angel off to one side, kneeling with a child in prayer. Father, how will it be your name, your kingdom come? Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. So childlike the approach, so simple the request. In that unpretentious prayer, we are asked to bring God our hopes for the future, as well as the hunger we have right now. We are asked to bring yesterday's failures, as well as tomorrow's fears. When we do, God will not turn us away. However, like a good father, he thoughtfully considers our requests before answering them. During that time, we often fidget as we wait, just like children. In our impatience, there is the danger of distorting both our needs and his response to them. When our needs are desperate, we become like the man with the bare cupboards in the parable, whose traveling friend dropped in on him unexpectedly. Frantically, we run to God, but in seeking him, we feel only the chilly aloneness of dark and deserted, deserted streets. We come to heaven's door, but it seems bolted from the inside. We knock but we feel we are rousing God from his sleep. We call out to him for help, but all we hear is the muffle of a brusque refusal. So we knock harder and call out louder. And when the door finally does open, we feel as if God has come to our aid begrudgingly. That is a distorted picture of God and how he responds to our prayers. Let's look at the parable again. Don't bother me, the irritated friend says. The door is already locked and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. Did you see it? Look closer. 
snuggled up next to that man or his children. Imagine how differently he would have responded to one of his own children waking up in the middle of the night saying, I'm thirsty, Daddy. Or if the children woke up the next morning saying, I'm hungry, Daddy. Would he roll over and go back to sleep? No. He would get up and get them what they needed. The ultimate point of the parable is not persistence. It is to clarify our relationship with God. We are not the frantic friend on the outside, knocking on the door. We are the beloved children on the inside, snuggled next to their father. If a sleeping friend can be roused to meet the needs of another friend in the middle of the night, how much more can a loving father be counted on to come to the aid of his children? Knowing that makes a big difference in how we pray. We don't need to beat down the door to get God's attention. All we have to do is whisper. He is that near to us. And we are that dear to him. That is why when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them the ABCs of prayer, he started off the first lesson with the words, Our Father. Lord, teach me to pray. Teach me to come to you with the outstretched arms of a child who runs to his or her father for comfort. As I come, fill me with all the love, all the respect, all the honor that a child should have for a parent. Take my small, clumsy hands in yours and walk with me, Lord. Lead the way through the dark streets and help me to keep pace with you so that your will would be done in my life here on earth as it is in heaven. Deliver me from my childish Christmas list of material prayers. Give me instead what I need this day to sustain my life, both the food I need for my body and the forgiveness I so desperately need for my soul. I am just a kid in this candy store world, Lord. Remember how weak I am and please, don't lead me down any aisles where I might become tempted to stray from you. We long for the companionship of God. We long for the assurance that we are not taking this journey alone, that he is walking with us and talking with us and intimately involved in our lives. We have all had moments when we've experienced something of that intimacy. Moments we can't quite explain, yet can't explain away. Moments when God has touched our lives like a soft hand of morning sun reaching through our bedroom window, brushing over our eyes and waking us to something eternal. At some of these windows, what we see offers simply a moment of insight, making us slower to judge and quicker to show understanding. At a few of them though, what we see offers a word spoken to the very depth of who we are. It may be a word to rouse us from sleep and ready us for our life's journey. It may be a word to warn us of a precipice or guide us to a place of rest. It may be a word telling us who we are and why we are here and what is required of us at this particular juncture of our journey. We don't know. Or in a startling sunburnt moment of grace, it may be a word telling us something we have longed for all of our lives to hear. A word from God, a word so precious, it would be worth the most arduous of climbs to hear the least audible of its echoes. 
windows of the soul is where we hear these words and where the journey begins. Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can come to you in prayer. Father, that we can pray. That we can just open our lives to you. Father, that we can be who you want us to be. Father, we just thank you that you are our Father, that we can cuddle up next to you, that you are there for us. Father, thank you for being there for us, for having your arms outstretched to us. Thank you for being there for us. Be with us now. We pray this in your precious son, Jesus' name. Amen. Be still for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One is here. Come bow before. For the benediction. Thank you, God, for those moments of my life when you opened a window and offered a word, nourished the hunger in my soul. Give me the grace to realize that these are the words I live by, not by bread alone, whatever form that bread may take, however satisfying it may seem at the time. Give me the grace to live not just reflectively, but receptively that I may not only notice when a window is open, but also receive what is offered, understanding that what is offered is my soul's daily bread. Amen. And God bless each and every one of you today.